Hello, everyone, and welcome. UC Berkeley Extension Science, Math, and Biotech Department is excited to host this panel event featuring professionals from biosciences, biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and regulatory affairs who are here to share their favorite networking and industry advancement career tips, um, whether you're brand new to the field, trying to move ahead in your career, or updating your knowledge base. Uh, if you have any questions during the event, please use the Q&A function to submit questions. Uh, we will open our panelists up to address as many questions as we can at approximately 1 p.m. You can also use the chat to send messages about technical issues or to message a panelist. Uh, we are recording this event. Uh, next slide, please. Founded in 1891, UC Berkeley Extension is the continuing education branch of the University of California, Berkeley. Today, we provide educational opportunities to more than 45,000 students each year by offering more than 2,000 courses annually, including in the online format. Uh, next slide, please. Our mission is to empower individual learners of every generation to realize their educational and career goals by providing access to UC Berkeley's network of instructors, experts, and professionals, creating rich learning experiences to develop skill sets and critical minds, and motivating our students to be the change they want to see. Next slide, please. To learn more about what we offer, please take a look at our website at extension.berkeley.edu. You can find all of our courses and programs in science, math, and biotech there. Next slide. The great thing about our courses and programs is that they're designed to be flexible and accessible to adult learners. Thank you again for joining our department and the Extension community in today's event. Um, you'll see also on this slide um, that these are our course formats. Um, we offer start anytime, continuous enrollment, live online, and fixed date. Um, and again, all of these can be found uh, on our website. Next slide, please. So my name is Erin Gunther, and I am a program specialist at UC Berkeley Extension's Department of Science, Math, and Biotechnology. Uh, I'm honored to be joined here today by three incredibly knowledgeable individuals who I will allow to introduce themselves uh, in the order that you see on your screen. So we'll start with Toby. Well, welcome everybody and thank you for inviting me to speak. So I have a PhD in molecular biology and then I went and did a couple of postdocs, <laughs> joined a startup, and then I went into biotech recruiting, and I've been recruiting in the biotech industry for about 18 years, but I am also the author of this book, Career Opportunities in Biotechnology and Drug Development, published by Colson Harbor Laboratory Press. And so what I do is I spend maybe 2% of my time giving talks, but the rest of my time, I'm a biotech recruiter, and what I do is I really try to help people find that right job and the right career and um, the right personality for for each person. So that's really what I do. I spend time helping people find that perfect job. And it's it's really fun. I really enjoy my job. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kalka, and I want to thank uh, Extension for this opportunity. Like Toby, I have a PhD also. And if you're good with accents, you'll recognize I was probably not born in this country. In fact, in the UK. I got educated there. I came over to Canada and the States and I was a professor for about 10 years. And during that time, I decided to move into industry and I've had a career spanning four decades in industry now, uh, including the last stint for the last 15 years as a consultant. And I work in the drug biopharm device industry. And I work with companies ranging from the uh, very large companies like Roche, uh, all the way to companies that I could mention the name that you've never heard of because they're like three or four people. 
And what do I work in? I work in everything from quality to regulatory affairs, to process development, to manufacturing, um, literally anything they need to get done. I also do some expert work, uh, expert witness work for lawyers in litigation, which is challenging. But the last 12 years, I've been teaching at extension in some of the courses that you may very well select to take. And that's very enjoyable to do that sort of activity. So I'll hand it on to the next. Thank you, Peter. And as you mentioned as well, um, uh, you, can, you can feel from my accent that I'm not originally from the US, I'm originally from Europe, Italy. And throughout my career, I've been working with a top major uh, pharmaceutical company. Actually, I moved from Europe when I was working with the Novartis, uh, relocating to the US. And in the US, I had the opportunity to work with uh, uh, other company, uh, some name that you may have recognized is uh, uh, Genentech as an example. Uh, right now, I'm in a, 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 a pharmaceutical company that is specializing in cell therapy. Uh, it's part of Gilead, and I'm the head of quality strategy and operation for uh, Kite Pharma. Um, as Peter Pete mentioned, uh, I'm also, uh, as my peer, um, an instructor of, uh, of the biotechnology program. Uh, specifically, I teach clinical trial uh, phases and uh, design. And I've been enjoying uh, being an instructor with, uh, with, uh, with extension uh, for the last three years. And I look forward to have this session with all of you today. Thank you so much to uh, each of you for being here. Um, so we'd love to hear about your personal experiences today, um, as well as some of your general tips uh, for people who are considering starting or advancing their career in the field. Uh, so I'll start with some background information for our attendees. Um, and Fabio, uh, if you'd like to start on this one, uh, how did you obtain uh, your first job in the field? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, I think like everybody, the first job is just by accident. So what happened is that my background, I'm a chemical engineer. And what happened, uh, I was working at the beginning of my career in the oil and gas field. But then there was an opportunity to move uh, through uh, this oil and gas uh, uh, line of work to the biopharmaceutical industry when there was the, uh, the swine flu uh, you know, uh, epidemic, or I don't even know it was a pandemic, right? So there was an urgency to hire more and more people in the vaccine uh, business. So at the time I was working in Milan in Italy and I had the opportunity to interview actually with the Novartis that was making the, the flu vaccine uh, specifically for the uh, swine flu uh, in, uh, in Italy. And there was a, a, an opportunity to move uh, over there. So it happened by, I would say that it was not engineer. It just happened by chance. But since then, I enjoy this line of uh, industry. And you know, I think I'll never go to other type of industry. I think the uh, pharmaceutical or biotech industry is the, is the, the sweet spot for me. Uh, because I, you know, the the fact that helping people and you know the product per se saving life is something that is the most rewarding piece of, of my job. I can jump in there. I actually started in the biotech field before the name biotech was actually used. Uh, in fact, it started in my PhD work in England. And I went to work at a government research lab, which uh, was affiliated with a university. And so my PhD was in microbiology and its application to producing proteins uh, by a variety of molecular techniques. So I started in academia and over time as it's evolved into industrial applications, uh, which become commercial. So I literally stepped into it fresh out of college, even before it was called biotech. Wow, that's impressive, Peter. 
So, um, yeah, when I, I finished my postdoc at Harvard and I wanted to go to industry. So, um, I, um, you'll find out that the biotech industry is very volatile, just like the tech industry. And when I was applying for jobs, it was right during the dot-com era where all the venture capitalists were giving money to dot-com companies and they were not funding the biotech industry. And I just started applying for jobs and I very fortunately landed in, in, and found a startup that just was a great match for me. And I worked there for three years. It was a lovely experience. And I was on the corporate development side, so helping with the fundraising. And then I went into executive retained recruiting, and that was super, super fun. And um, and again, I, I, did, I applied for jobs, and I interviewed a lot of places, and I picked the place that was the best match for me. And then I, I quit my job and wrote the book, <laughs> and then I started on my own recruiting independently. So... Thank you so much. Um, so as a uh, follow up question, um, can you tell us how networking has played a role in your career development? And Peter, we will start with you. OK, well, actually, once again, I'm going to tell you the story. It started very early. And in fact, when I was an undergraduate, I think it was about 19 or 20 uh, in like one year before graduation, I knew I wanted to do a PhD. I happened to have a lab partner who was, I'll call it a mature student. She was somewhat like 40, which seemed incredibly old to a 19 year old. And she and I became good friends there. And she got to know me and knew my personality and the things that I was interested. And she said to me, you know who you should get a PhD with? It's a guy I was a laboratory technician for, for a number of years. He's a really nice person. He's brilliant. And you'll learn a lot. And the rest is history. I ended up going to work for a uh, very prominent professor in, in the UK who became the research director of a government research institute, one of the big ones. It, it was sure totally serendipity that it happened. I'll give you one other quick example, and that's further into my career. I was working at a big pharmaceutical company, and you know they have reorganizations every so often. So guess what? The reorg happened, and I'm suddenly standing with no job. Of course, losing your job is one of those very traumatic things and you feel guilty because what did I do wrong? Well, in a lot of cases, you didn't do a thing wrong. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And back in those days, there wasn't really internet resources. You had as your resources, a landline and a roller deck. And probably many of the people here won't know what a Rolodex is. It's simply a very simple system for writing on cards, phone numbers, names, etc. And I was cold calling colleagues of mine to look for jobs. I had a great guy who worked with me uh, previously who actually made me the connection that got me in the pre-internet era, my next job. So it was whenever I met someone, I was careful to take down their name, their phone number and address. This was before email addresses, which make it so much easier today. So it's everybody that you contact, you may not know whether they will be valuable in the future. But take that information, store it. It may help you later on. And I'll be happy to share also a story about my latest job, how I landed. I started Akai one year and a half ago. And before I was working actually in the Bay Area, and now I relocated to Santa Monica. And how this happened is that I was organizing a network event, 
I volunteer for an organization that is called Parental Drug Association. I was the formal president and treasurer of the uh, chapter uh, Bay Area chapter area. And I contacted a couple of people to be in the panel, like this panel. I was contacting people, hey, I think you would be a great fit for this panel. Why don't we connect and talk about that? And one of the person that I contacted is my current boss. <laughs> so we start to talk and we say, oh, uh, what you do? And he was asking me what you are currently doing. And I was sharing that, oh, you know, I'm a chemical engineer, but now I work in finance. And he was looking for somebody that had a little bit of editing in the biotech. And this is how we start to talk. And he show at certain point during our talk, hey, I actually have a job opening in my group. Would you be interested just to look at that and say, well, okay, let's, let's see after the panel. If you come to the, to the networking event, we can continue our conversation. So networking, I guess it's, a, as, a, as Pete was also mentioning, as a very uh, uh, magic power because by serendipity, sometimes you cannot plan something. It's like when you plant something in your garden, you hope that some of the seeds will sprout, but uh, it may lend you to your next job. So I would say that at least for me, it worked pretty well because I'm in this role because I met my boss during a networking uh, event mm -hmm. or setup that I was planning to. Great, and I would add that um, as we all know, networking is very powerful because you are personally vouched for. So in addition to um, job hiring managers having a big pile of resumes, if somebody says, hey, this person's really great and blah, 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 you know, that will, you know, for sure, the hiring manager is going to more likely be consider this person. So yes, it's very powerful. And so is LinkedIn. Um, and to add to Fabio's experience, um, so as a recruiter, networking is, you know, the same. I mean, I network, I recruit, same thing. You, I rely heavily on networking, but I'm also the program chair at the Bioscience Forum, which is a nonprofit uh, re for the biotech community in the Bay Area, and um, I'm the program chair. So I would recommend for all of you that if you want to get into the industry to not only attend those you know, association, and there's tons of associations for whatever area interests you, but not only attend, but get involved, be a you know, program manager, invite people, whatever, just get involved in, in the programs. Thank you so much. Um, so coming to the present day and looking forward, um, what are some trends you're seeing in the profession? And we'll go back to you, Toby, to start us off. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, the biotech industry has been booming and we're really, really, the industry uh, dynamics are, have been great for since uh, 2019, 20, 21, and, 20, uh, and, and 22. And in fact, there was scarcity of talent. I mean, as a recruiter, we, you know, there was, it was very hard to find talent. But now, you know, following the tech industry, there's a bit of um, belt tightening. Companies are looking at cash and there is more difficult to raise money. And unfortunately, as we, the Silicon Valley Bank went under, which is really um, been bad for the industry because, as you know, they're um, involved in um, startups. So it's, it's a little bit of a changing time. And I still think they're still hiring in the discovery areas. Um, but what happens in a biotech company is they raise money, they start in discovery research, they get into preclinical, and then they get into clinical, and then they save their money and spend it on the clinical. And a lot of times they close their research department. So this is an ever evolving thing that happens quite often. If it's a company's big enough, then they keep their research team. So that's kind of a general trend. At, at, at any time, but um, but I have been seeing more layoffs in the CNC area and the manufacturing. And that's where I've kind of been seeing, you know, where if there are layoffs, um, but it's it's not really bad. I don't and I don't know. It's the trend is going down, but I don't know when it's going to stop and, and return. But I do think that you know, with immunotherapy, with CAR T, that's actually curing people of cancer. There's uh, CRISPR. I mean, there's a lot of great some 
things that are happening in industry and, and immunotherapy has been a blockbuster and cancer, you know, there's tons of therapies and development. So I do think we have great dynamics right now. And I, I don't think um, we're going to, you know, I think that hiring is going to continue and it's going to continue strong. And in fact, just to give you an example, uh, last year, I, if you go onto LinkedIn and I typed in molecular biology, I was over 10,000 job postings, 10,000 in the Bay Area for molecular biology. Now it's 5,000. <laughs> so just to give you a sense of hiring. Next. I would say trends is everything changes. Nothing stays the same. Uh, we had Toby give example of technology. So when you enter into this industry, if you get the opportunity, don't expect to retire from that position doing the same job. We have to maintain nimbleness and be prepared to take on new challenges, particularly with smaller companies. You might very well get hired in because of your expertise in topic A, and you'll do the job for topic A for the company. Keep your eyes up, looking around at what isn't getting done, because that will be the opportunity for you. And I think whether a company shifts from this technology to another, many of the skills that you have, yes, you'll have to reinvent yourself for a modified job or different job and to move in that direction. I would definitely say keep in a learning mode. Keep your eyes on what are the hot topics of types of drugs being developed. Uh, Toby listed quite a few in there. That doesn't mean to say some of the I'll call it older type drugs, the small molecular weight drugs are going away. No, they are still there. The conventional biotech type products, and I'll use Genentech as an example, Perceptin, Avastin, these types of products are being developed every day by other companies. What you have to realize, there's a lot of work going on in industry on, I'll call it more conventional technologies that never see headlines in newspapers. And, and so it's the analogy I always give is if you look out there and if you watch six-year-olds play football, and for North America, I mean soccer, you see them play and they're all rushing towards the ball. They never play positions. Do the same in your career. Don't rush to trendy areas necessarily. There are plenty of opportunities in, I'll call it more conventional drug development as well. Those are not going away. So just remember like six-year-olds dashing for the ball, they a lot of people will be dashing for RT, CRISPR type positions when there may be great jobs in more conventional. So don't dismiss opportunities just because it's not trendy. I love what you mentioned, Pete, because I agree totally with you. I mean, uh, we should not dismiss opportunities just because they are not trendy, so we are not talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, I I can see that right now, kind of where are the highest uh, demand of opportunity, at least for autologous and CAR T is in the manufacturing or in QC. So if you want to have a good job with a nice salary, just to start, you know, QC area of any biotech company will uh, pay fairly well. Then, of course, as Pete was mentioning, what is the opportunity? What are the opportunity now? Will not be in five years because you know, in ten years, things can totally change because the technology can change. So, think about also how you can equip yourself on how you can reinvent yourself and learning new skills as you get along the way. Uh, an example. 
I started in manufacturing as a chemical engineer working night shift. And then I moved to finance. Don't ask me how I made the leap, but at a certain point I made the leap. And then now I'm back in the quality organization. This is, you know, you need to go with the flow and stay on top of what's happening right now in your, uh, in your space, so to speak. So that being said, uh, a follow-up question. Um, what are some careers that people can pursue when starting out in the industry? Um, and where are you seeing, I guess, growth opportunities within the field? Uh, and we can go back to you, Fabio. That's a good question because it sometimes it depends where we see ourselves maybe ahead of time, 10 years, but it's it's a difficult projection. What has been my experience is that uh, I would say that a good entry point is at the bench or is in manufacturing because where, whenever you will be you know, a CEO or a VP, you always remember that feeling and the work that you had to do at the tactical level working in the manufacturing in the night shift. I always remind people that I started my career working also in the night shift in Italy production. So when we have this dialogue and a conversation about manufacturer, manufacturing organization, uh, there's something that I can be uh, part of. So uh, don't be worried about get your hand dirty. I, 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 I've been exposed to uh, several um, entry level, uh, uh, um, so to speak, uh, uh, students that they were looking for a job and they were looking for, I'm not saying a director or a VP role, but you know, almost there. And I was mentioning, well, you first want to start, you know, as an associate, maybe in manufacturing in the QC. And then after a couple of years of experience or less depends on, on, on the opportunity, you will move up. But don't be afraid to, you know, the usual get from the basic, you know, learn the basics of the industry and then move up within the organization. Uh, that's my best advice that I can give. So I can jump in there. And I, I think that when you're ready to move into this industry, the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, what skills do I have? So typically somebody fresh out of college, you've got a little bit of lab experience. You have either a chemistry, an engineering, or a uh, microbiology or biotech experience. So think where your skills are. And just as Fabio said, the first, entry positions are often utilizing those skills. One good example can be in a manufacturing for engineering. It can be in process development, either with engineering or biochemistry background. It could be analytical development if you have a chemistry or micro background. And those become the initial steps. And that's how I transitioned from academia, where I was a research professor who taught. And my skills at that point were running labs. So my first job in industry, I was brought in because of my micro and biochemistry background. I got a job running a pilot plant to manufacture material under GMP. And I jokingly say, I didn't understand what GMP stood for. I had to learn how to spell it first, never mind what it meant. But I use my skills. And my career has been a constant learning. I moved from that experience using my biochemistry to analytical development. It's learning what you're good at using it and then learning more so you become broader so you actually can step into the next job we're not looking for revolutionary steps for most people it's incremental steps so in mine i went from manufacturing process development into analytical development to qc to qa to worldwide head of quality for a company, including regulatory affairs. 
And from that experience, I branched out to consulting in everything I'd worked on before. So it's learning, it's understanding your skills, it's putting it together and asking, what can I do for my potential employer? And that becomes you marketing yourself. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. So it really depends on your background and you really want to leverage your current skill set. But also it depends on what what are your career aspirations? What do you want to do? And um, you might want to do some self-assessment. Um, there's a there's a free self-assessment tool called myidp.careers.org. A science careers, I think, with science, the magazine. The, anyways, that's a great free self-assessment tool. So do some self-assessment. If you can work with career counselors, that would help. Um, and also, I would say, you know, my book, you know, really covers all, all the different careers. So this is basically a concrete. These are all the chapters, but each of these are, you know, in depth, uh, many, many careers. And so what I'm showing you is there's over 100 different careers in life, and there's many more than that, really. Um, and you don't necessarily need a science background for a lot of these jobs. Um, there's lots of jobs in finance, HR, um, manufacturing, a lot of quality. There's a lot of uh, jobs where you don't need a science background and you can you know, transition your current skill sets into this field. Um, also, there's also the medical device industry, which um, likes to hire. And then there's healthcare IT, there's um, I bio, you know, there's lots and lots of fields, not just making drugs, you know, so I would add that as well. Thank you so much. Um, so moving on to our next question, um, what are some of your favorite networking tips for someone, um, you know, in the process of job searching? And we'll start with you, Peter. Yeah, well, I gave some examples of networking. And uh, if you ever get to know me, the one thing you will find out about me is, I love to talk to people and I love to listen. So talking and listening, uh, going outside your comfort zone is another element, particularly if you're at meetings. So technical meetings are great opportunities for networking. Um, I write articles in the electronic press in biotech and biopharmaceuticals. I do it because I enjoy doing it. And editors like me because when I predict I will produce an article on time, I've never missed a deadline. And so they come back to get more. This serves as a networking tool for me because it gets my name out. And I will often, as a consultant, get people asking me questions. And sometimes this leads to opportunities. Uh, electronically, there is the social media, the one I think everybody utilizes, which is incredibly good networking, is LinkedIn. It's the, I call it the premier um, um, opportunity for uh, actually connecting yourself with people. And I often say, don't be shy about offering a connection with somebody. If they have a background that's interesting that you would like to learn more about, a cold invitation out to there might make a connection. But two things I want to warn you is somebody, some people will say no, and that's their prerogative. Other people that connect will immediately bombard you with what they wanted to connect for, almost in a very aggressive fashion. So you've got to be prepared to say no. And I've unlinked for people who are pests, but you got to go out. And I think LinkedIn is a great opportunity to learn about the industry, particularly in some of the groups that they have there. I use this connection tool if I want to get some opinions and I may pick from my connections and I have 
over 3,000 now connected with me. I will go in and select maybe 10 or 15. If I have a technical question, I want to get an answer for. So I'll have a client who wanted to know who are the good contract manufacturers out there. So I send a message to my connections. So which of the top three CMOs for the following technology? And which are the bottom three CMOs you wouldn't touch at all? So it's, and I get a 95% response from people I ask these questions. In many respects, I am saying, you have expertise, can you help me? And people love to help people. And so you'll often find these people will respond and they'll be very candid. Um, I would definitely say those technical meetings, don't be shy of going up and introducing yourself, giving the business card, et cetera, because you never know that person might be the secret link for a question you have or an opportunity that may come up. Another networking opportunity is people you run into on a daily basis. During my career, which has spanned a long time, I've had hundreds, if not thousands of people who've reported to me in my organizations. And I like to believe I've been a good boss. And the reason I say that is I get clients who used to work for me when they were junior. They've risen up. Now they're directors and VPs and they want a consultant. Who do they go to? They come to me because I've worked with them before. Even teaching at Cal in extension, I've actually ended up connecting, usually through LinkedIn, with people and they've come back, either offering work for me or wanting advice on things for their future, like career growth. And so I would definitely say in personal meetings, LinkedIn, and try and eliminate boundaries and barriers as you interface. And one of the tips that uh, we'd love to share with uh, uh, networking, especially if you are early in your career, uh, is not just attend a networking event, but kind of be a player. What I'm saying is that uh, this networking event don't, don't come all of a sudden by themselves, but there are people that put them together. As an example, I am organizing some of these networking events and I always look for volunteers, right? Because it's a volunteer job. So be able to support those networking events and then having the conversation as Pete was mentioning about uh, with, with different people, you can introduce yourself during the network event saying, yeah, I helped the organization to put this. I was working on the marketing or whatever. And it creates you that, potential kind of connectivity that the person that you are working with can reflect on the good job that you are doing on the networking event so can start to establish those uh, links. So, I mean, it's good to uh, attending networking event as an attendees, but if you want to stand out of the thousand people that are attending networking events, you know, you want to show how you are contributing to the event and to make that a successful event. That is one of my favorite tip uh, that I can give to somebody that is early in their career or is between jobs. So you may have some extra time to dedicate and volunteer with this organization and can be any type of organization, it can be uh, the Bioscience Forum, the, the PDA, the Project Management Institutes. There are tons of organizations that are always looking for volunteers that they would be more than happy to have your support. 
Yes, we all agree going to those nonprofit associations is a great first step. And there is association for whatever topic or career interests you. So if you're interested in regulatory affairs, RAPS is fabulous and we have a great chapter. If you're interested in clinical, ACRP is an obvious one. Um, there's a project management when there's one for bioinformatics. Um, whatever the topic, there is a society for you. So definitely I would recommend attending those. That would be my first pick. But another thing is don't just go to meetings to network. You should network wherever you go, whether you're like if I'm out backpacking and I'm handing out my cards. Um, <laughs> but like the obvious one is being on an airplane because you're stuck in a seat and you're, there's a person sitting next to you. This is a great opportunity to tell, tell you know this person about, you know, your background and before you know it, you get a job in their company. And it mm -hmm. happens all the time. But you know, anywhere you go, um, at parties wherever network all the time bring your cards be be prepared and then another great place to network that nobody thinks about is when you interview so when you do interview for jobs it's a great opportunity to meet new people and to network with them and in fact i when i the few times that i did interview i stayed in touch with those people that i met i didn't take the job but i <laughs> stayed in touch with those folks and and we stayed friends and i tried to recruit them later on <laughs> in life um but what and also another thing is if you're making a career transition um and let's say you want to go into regulatory affairs um attending the raps event is a great place to then meet at directors and vps and and leaders who are experts and then you can you know say hey i'm interested in regulatory affairs would you do an informational interview with me and so that's a great way then to meet these people to meet the you know get to know them well and then maybe they become your mentor and they can help you guide you in your career so your know, informational interviewing is a great way to to build your network and but the one caveat I have as a recruiter, I have to say, if you see a really great job opportunity posted on LinkedIn or whatever the place that is posted, and you really, really want this job, I would recommend that you apply first and then network your way. Don't try to network your way in because that takes time and you may not find the right hiring manager through the process. And you, as a recruiter, we want to fill those positions as fast as possible. And if you try networking your way in there, the position could be gone, you know, in a week or two. So um, so definitely apply first and then network. I mean, obviously, networking will help you get the job, but and if you but you need to apply first. Um, Aaron, if I can add one extra comment of uh, a, a topic which has come up, and this is you should look at networking as investing and volunteering as investing. Don't immediately think you're going to get a return on that investment in the minutes or hours or days. Often you're investing out there without the knowledge of whether anything is gonna come of it. It may not be a high percentage of things that come, but if you don't invest, I can guarantee no opportunity will come automatically. So it's you're investing, you're building up your um, credentials out there um, and getting it out into the, um, the world so that if people notice you then when an opportunity comes up they think of you that sort of thing yeah speaking about the silicon valley you know uh, analogy is uh, raise money when you don't need money so <laughs> <laughs> So what advice uh, do you have for job seekers to stand out to potential employers? And we can go back to you, Toby, if you want to start us off. Yeah, great. So the best way to stand out is actually to be a good match for the opportunity. <laughs> so the company is looking to hire people with certain skill sets. And so if you can line up your resume and match the same skill sets, they're going to say, oh, this person's very qualified. I'm going to consider that person. Um, so that would be, you know, the obvious thing. And then the other thing that I've seen happen, um, this is kind of rare, but perseverance. So a lot of times companies are hiring and then the hiring stalls for whatever reason, maybe they have a wait ward or I don't know, something happens and then, you know, and the position is still on hold. Reach back out and show your interest. 
say, you know, I really, really like this job. I really want to come here. So companies love to see that you're interested. So express interest in the opportunity. Tell them how much you really want to work there. Uh, I can jump in on this. It starts off, the first thing I always say is have a strong, I call it package of resumes. There's no such thing as a resume. Uh, a, a resume is, has to be tailored for what you're looking for, unless you're very narrow in your field. Um, I tend to have several resumes that focus on different aspects. And it depends what I'm applying for. So when I was looking for jobs, and I would see a job that was in QC, I would tailor my resume to emphasize the QC parts. If it was a QA job, I would emphasize the QA side. The other important thing is look at the level of depth you have on it. If you are a person without a degree going into the job market, it may be very appropriate to list your skills as Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. But once you've been in the job market for a while, these types of skills are assumed for everybody. Um, it's only if you are an expert in some esoteric software that almost nobody has heard of, that may be the only time when you would put that as a skill. So if, for instance, you had five years experience uh, running QC labs, don't put Microsoft Word or Excel. It gives the impression of you're a very low level thinker. You must assume a lot of the skills that you have are expected. And it's not something that makes you stand out. But I think uh, the, the key that Tony said, it's the match between what the job is and what your skill base is. And that's why I advocate for perhaps tailored resumes for different types of jobs. That becomes very important. In other words, read what the job is and ask what my skills are and be prepared to recognize, maybe you don't have all the skills. I'm not advocating you put a black box warning on the bottom, I don't have the following skills. Let during the interview process, it come out, but do your research before you go there. So you can say, I don't have experience, but this is what I know about it. And I think these skills may help me in fine tuning. Most, rec most people hiring don't expect you to be 100% fit for everything in the job. What they're looking for is somebody that's a good fit for the majority, but somebody also that you have confidence will be able to learn, assimilate, become expert in that given time in the job. I agree with uh, you know spending time to work on your resume specifically, you know, uh, custom tailoring it to the to the job opportunity and you know sometimes is uh, uh, it can be a struggle so maybe if you have not done this before there are amazing professionals that can you help out uh, with you know work on your resume so seek also for these professional advices uh, and then of course uh, as you are going through the job description open the job description read through it you know <laughs> and you know as peter was mentioning so see where in your resume or different type of resume that you may prefer which one is the better match because the first uh, goal is to get an interview right so and the majority of the time is through sending your resume or making the application and after you you are in the interview stage 
listen and ask questions to the interviewer on what the person is really looking for because in a you know as a as somebody that also seeks for seek for people i have maybe 10 or 20 requirements but of all these 20 what i'm looking at are specific five so and if somebody is able to perceive what i'm really looking from uh, a job description you know uh, definitely it's a it's a candidate that stands out uh but definitely you know read the job description match your resume to the job description uh and you know when you have the interview listen and ask questions to your interviewer thank you so i think we've got time maybe for one more before we move to our um our q a and turn it to the audience to um get some questions there but um you know, one thing, uh, if you could uh, suggest to someone moving into the industry uh, for the first time to have on their resume, um, if, you know, there was, you know, one thing that you could think that is important, what would you um, suggest? Highlighting your skill set. Um, or, you know, if you have no skill set, <laughs> you could talk about, I mean, there's a, like, there's a need for limbs people and people in other areas, you know, without the science background in the company. So, you know, you can highlight that. Um, you could also, I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, oh, my father had diabetes, you know, <laughs> and show, show a personal interest and personal investment into finding cures. Um, so that's another thing you can do you can show motivation and drive, but, um, but are we going to talk about LinkedIn, Aaron? I'm not sure if there's time but um what i was going to add is that you know linkedin is more important than resumes now i mean recruiters and hiring managers alike are using linkedin and so um you know they reach out to you on linkedin to recruit talent and then they ask for your resume and then that once you are matched they interview you and you're matched and then they send your resume to the company so LinkedIn is the new resume. It's, it's really important. And it's really important that you have those keywords. And so as recruiters, what we're doing is, and hiring managers too, so the people hiring, we're looking for those keywords. And so the more words you have, I mean, not like you should have verbose and tons of paragraphs, but you know, the, the right terminology in your LinkedIn profile and, and you can mix it up. So you can say NK and natural killer cells, you know, you can, you can, and then add as many keywords as you can so that you're more likely to be seen. So if as a recruiter, if I'm doing a recruiting project and I look for a word and you're not in the, you know, that word isn't in your profile, even though you're an expert, I'm I'm not going to see your profile yeah. so it's really important to really fill those things fill out the linkedin profile particularly in your experience section so a lot of people put just their title and their their job title and the experience but to add you know several bullets describing this is what i worked on this is the therapeutic area i'm working in this is the step i'm in i'm in preclinical process development formulation whatever and i'm a chemist you know i mean just you know add your degree what what's your what's your technical background so i would really recommend you fill it out and then the thing that recruiters look for that nobody knows about is um if you do LinkedIn premium or Biz premium, I think it is, it puts a logo by your name. And that basically says, welcome recruiters, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> so, yep. <it> does. <laughs> and so um, it's like, please reach out to me, I'm looking. Um, not necessarily. Some people have it just to network or for business development reasons. It's not necessarily that they're looking, but it's but a lot of people do that. So if you really are looking for a job, a recruiter is more likely to reach out to you if you have that LinkedIn premium logo next to your name or open to networking or open to work. You know, those, those things, those are things you can do to say, hey, I'm looking for a job. So, um, so, so the real, so the way to get a job is you network, you apply, and you fill out your profile, LinkedIn, and you work with recruiters. I mean, you know, sure. that's how you get a job. I, I, I would like to, to jump in. Uh, Toby, I've learned something in this session, which is great. I have been for like 15 years a premium member. That explains why I keep getting recruiters calling me. I am not looking for a job. I have my own consulting company. I'm very, very happy. 
but I have that premium because it gives me much more search tools as well. So I would definitely say it depends where you are in your career. If you are wanting to step in to it, pay great attention to not just LinkedIn, but your resume and look at what the job requires and make sure those words are included. Because you have to realize that for positions, we may get hundreds of applicants. And often, I know when I was back in industry, it would might be my admin who did the first screening and they were looking for keywords. If the keyword wasn't in, the diamond in the rough was lost. So pay attention to the job, what the skills are, and you have to do it, be honest about it. Put it in those, in those words, not your own words, so that it gets uh, definitely picked up on. I would say when you're further along in your career, they're looking for other things, not so much specific skills, but they're looking for the ability to manage people, which is often described by how big your organization was, what's the breadth of responsibilities, those types of things. But if you're just getting in at a more junior level, then the detail of skill base, just ask the question, if you were hiring for this position, what would you look for? I always, I'm an advocate of putting yourself in the other person's shoes and imagine what their life is like, trying to go through resumes. And I, I've generally, and Toby, tell me if I'm wrong, I've said resumes that are shorter are better because it's often, it gets to the point. And by short, I mean two pages, maybe three, but I've received 20 page resumes. Can I tell you, after page two, my eyes are glossing over and that resume is going over my shoulder. I'm not going to look any further. More is not more. And I don't remember the exact quote, but actually, you know, uh, having your resume in one, two pages, I think two is kind of the magic number. Also, uh, and people have done in their career amazing stuff, but it shows also uh, capacity of synth Size and focus information in the uh, you know in the small amount of of uh, of, uh, of of time or uh, real estate that can be a two pages and um, I agree I agree totally because I mean I, there are some hiring that I'm actually doing and I received a lot of resume and uh, uh, honestly I go through you know my quick reading techniques and I start to look for the, you know the key things that capture my attention and you know that's the first screening that um, I, yeah. I usually do one thing that helped me also at the top of the resume there is kind of a high level summary of a couple of sentences that summarize everything amazing had happened you know year of experience you know, something that captured my attention is like when you're writing um, a news, uh, uh, an article for a newspaper, you have a, a big, high, uh, you know, uh, title for you, the newspaper, and then you start to have people dig in and dig in and getting their interest. But I, I agree with what has been shared about uh, those great tips. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um... So this is where we will um, turn to the Q&A portion of the event. Um, so you can use the Q&A function to share your questions with our panel uh, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. I saw one question about moving from Europe to the US. Uh, so I can try to give my two cents that I've experienced, what I've experienced. So when I was working in Europe, actually I was working for Novartis at the time in manufacturing, you know, uh, Simply as can you can you can feel this. I had to badge multiple times to enter the building and exiting the building because my salary, you know, I was paid by the the hour over there. And when I came to the US, it was more uh, not by hour, but by what I was able to accomplish. 
And basically it was more set by my kind of way of working. I, I don't really, you know, count the hour that I'm working on something as far I can accomplish that. So this is one of the great things that I noticed about the difference between at least my experience in Europe to the US. Uh, in the US, I have I had more uh, objective or goal-based approach to work. In Europe is more our base approach. You work eight hours and that's it, right? So I really like that uh, different approach of, uh, you know, setting goals and prospective to work, at least for me. What about, what about you, Pete? You moved to the US as well. Yeah, um, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, I, I was in my 20s and I moved to Canada and then the US. Um, uh, I've lived here so long, I still feel a foreigner here because of my accent and other things. When I go back to the UK, I feel a foreigner there because I'm very Americanized in many, many respects. I kind of consider myself more like a man of the world now. And I'm, I'm quite comfortable actually crossing uh, barriers, cultural uh, country barriers. And I've done a lot of work in countries like Brazil, Japan, Korea, Singapore, China, Vietnam, Australia, and actually uh, the UK too, uh, as well. So I, I tend to kind of consider uh, stepping out from, I call it my comfort zone. And, and that's reflected not just from a geographic, but it's areas of technology. I'm quite prepared jumping into something totally new, working on the principle I can learn, that sort of thing. There's a great question I, I see somebody put, how or where would you recommend someone with a non-traditional background, e.g. math, to get started? Well, the first thing you have to look at is, and I've said this before, what's your skill set? And I can immediately say there's huge opportunities with somebody with good mathematical skills in clinical trials. Statistics is the life and death of a drug. Either it meets the endpoint or it doesn't meet the endpoint. I tell you, in manufacturing, understanding process capability, which is statistical evaluation. Method validation is determining precision, which has mathematical components to it. Math is central to everything we do. I would definitely say, don't pigeonhole yourself. Say, my skills in math is critical thinking, being able to formulate, come up with formulae to answer questions. The area in process development, experimental design, where you do minimum number of experiments to get the most information is an area which is the oyster for career. It comes down to my skills are here, where can it be used? I may have to reinvent myself and learn things new. But isn't that part of the fun of careers? It is. And, you know, to add to that, anybody with any uh, non-traditional background, you know, uh, may find a spot in the in the biotech. Uh, I know people that have been, uh, you know, have a degree in philosophy, in, uh, you know, in uh, in the other non-traditional biotech field, and they are working in the biotech industry yeah. because, as Pete was mentioning, there is an application in the biotech as an end-to-end industry to all those aspects that you have been trained is finding the, the right match between what you have to offer and what the company is yeah. seeking at that moment. I'll, I'll jump in if I can. I remember a hire about 15 years ago. I needed a person in the plant. This is somebody with a quality background who would go to a manufacturing location to make sure everything was run right. This manufacturing plant was in Germany and it was a part of Germany where yes, people spoke 
English, but not as great as other parts. And we obviously recognized it would be great if the person in the plant spoke German. We hired a PhD German literature person who came into our company. We gave him a six month crash course on quality, biotech, et cetera. And he was damn good at the end. He went over and he was one of the best persons in the plant. He understood the science from the cram course but he understood the nuance of the language. He understood the person, personal interfaces better. And I contend he was the highest paid PhD German literature uh, major that's out there. It, he had an incredible salary, much more than typical for that field. So I want to add that um, I'm looking at the questions. A lot of them are focused on clinical, how to get into the clinic and uh, clinical careers. So um, in clinical development, of course, there's managing the clinical trials, which there's tons of careers in that, right? Um, but there are a lot of other careers that people don't consider in clinical. So there's medical writing, so that's yeah. writing up the results, um, and that leads into regulatory affairs. It's a really great career. People don't know about it. There's also medical science liaison. So a lot of MDs from international MDs, they come here, they don't want to get another MD here. So they go into medical science liaison kind a role, which is basically talking to doctors, you're not promoting a drug, you're like the expert and you're explaining the latest clinical data. But then there's a whole area called medical affairs, where you basically after the drug is approved, you're working on expanding those indications and again, communicating to other doctors who are prescribing these therapies, you're communicating to them about the latest clinical trials. There's an area called um, medical communications where you're running like events with leading medical doctors and you explain all the latest technology. Um, so, um, and there's statistical programming, there's clinical, uh, clinical database management. Um, there's a, just a lot of clinical project manager. I mean, it goes on and on. There's hundreds of careers in clinical. So it, it is a little challenging to get in. I mean, I would imagine um, if you if you haven't worked in, uh, you know, that maybe like a, a master's in clinical might help you make that transition to clinical. That might be an idea. And same thing with regulatory. It's very hard to get into regulatory, but once you're in, that is a great career. You know, yeah. that is, talk about careers in high demand. Regulatory has been the career in high demand for a very long time. So, what, you know, once you're in, it, it's great, but getting in is hard. So um, you might consider a master's in regulatory. Yeah. yeah so. Um, I, I see about three or four questions that have a common theme. This is a sensitive topic. And this is often people who come into this country from abroad. And they come in with credentials from their own country, which are very good. I've actually run into many of these people taking the classes that I teach in extension. And the typical person is somebody who's come from one of these countries. They've worked in the industry there, but when they come to this country, they apply for jobs, they never get interviews. And the problems that you run into with those people are something like threefold. The first one is often the resume is not written in a fashion that encourages somebody to read forward and delve further. Often with these people, some of them are women and they've either come over with a husband who has a visa and they have not got a visa yet. And so they have a gap in their resume. Other ones have raised a family and have come over and they have gaps in their resume. I've often helped these people in rewriting a resume and being upfront and explaining in simple terms, 
what the gaps are and why they are. And at least having that front and center, the person, if they're prepared to look further, understands what the gap is. It's not some mysterious job you were fired from. The other one is the reluctance of employers in this country to recognize the value of the person because of where they've worked. The, the feeling that the, for instance, Chinese or Indian or other country regulatory agency isn't as good as the US, therefore their standards won't be equivalent. But often they've worked for companies that actually export drugs into this country. And so you have to get over that, what I would call bias in the resume. And sometimes those people have taken jobs that are lower in the hierarchy of what they really deserve. And I've actually encouraged them, sometimes you have to bite the bullet and accept that once you're in, if you're really as good as you are and you've got a good boss, they'll recognize it. And guess what? Having been a boss, it's wonderful if you pick out one of those people who are so good, you, you fast track them through the organization and they will, given a bit of time, will get to where they should be. Well, as a recruiter, I more often encounter the problem of the company cannot afford to sponsor somebody. Yeah. yeah, the process is very difficult. And so what I would recommend to international folks who are have an interest in getting a job is you, know, you should take owner, if you can, try to take ownership of your own visa, talk to a lawyer yourself, figure out what your options are. And if you can apply for a green card, do it yourself. It's, it's not that expensive. You don't need to be spot. I mean, well, you need to be sponsored to work, but if you can do your own green card, um, you're way ahead of the game. And a lot of companies, they say, I'll, I'll, we'll sponsor you. But then they have this thing called a clawback clause, which means that if you need to stay in this company for, I don't know, three or five years, and if you leave, you're paying all the legal fees that we spent on you. Watch what you sign. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, you, if you're, you know, if, so the legal issue, and particularly for small companies, it's very, very hard for them to sponsor. And a lot of times it's not so much the cost, it's the, the risk. Yeah. Because um, you if you have to go through a lottery, it's, it's you know, it's really, really risky and they really want to hire you and, and they can't take that risk. Um, so it's the risk and the time because it's very, very slow to get visas. So unfortunately, I wish it was faster. I wish it was easier. I really do. But um, yeah, that's been, and it's particularly bad in California because we're competing with the tech industry because they also are hiring people with, with visas. And so they're also sponsoring and we fill the quotas. And I've even heard from a lot of uh, candidates that they actually are going to the East Coast in order to speed up the visa process because uh, on the East Coast, they're not filling out the quotas as quickly as we are here in California. So um, yeah, it, it's really a problem. I deal with this all the time. And and, um, it's very unfortunate. So I totally agree with you, Peter. There's one question there that says, what software do we need to know to get into the biotech industry? I don't think there's any software you need. What you must be prepared to is learn the software of the company you get the job in. Um, th there will be electronic systems that you have to use. And as such, you better be attuned to learning that software. I'm not aware of any software you, you, you really need to, to know, except I would say, obviously, and I'll go against what I said before, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, those types of things, and maybe Zoom might be useful. Probably got time for about one more question, just filtering through these. I think you've answered a lot of them. There's one right at the end or near the end, uh, and it says, any advice for older candidates switching careers 
I'm from legal and research trying to move to RA. Uh, I, actually, I, I actually know this person. He's taken one of my classes. Uh, I, I would definitely say, as I said before, look at what your skills are. You've worked in the legal area. You've been you've involved in research. Look at the skill base in the legal profession you have. And that may be if, in fact, your legal is litigation between companies, this may be uh, pharmaceutical companies or device companies. This may be the avenue to tailor your skills into moving into a company in a function that can build on your work experience. Initially, you might go into the legal department, but if you have those skills that may be applicable to more regulatory affairs, then that may be something with courses like Cal offers in the certificate program. It's building your portfolio of experience and skill base so that you can meet those job requirements. And I, I know the, the, the older we get, the, the, there is a thing called age discrimination, or it appears that way. Although I must say, I, I've not consciously ever run into it uh, myself, particularly as a consultant. Actually, as a recruiter, I like older candidates because this industry, it takes so long to understand all the many, many nuances. And it takes so long to understand how to do a clinical trial and or to yeah. manufacture stem cells that I personally like age. I love, the older, the better. <laughs> but I really, I seriously, I do. Um, and so, um, you know, I like that. But, but however, I would say that, you know, somebody wants to work at the bench and they, you know, had it already, they're very really seasoned. Probably not right. I mean, the, usually the bench, you know, research associate level, they're usually fresh out of college or fresh yeah. out of the master's or fresh out of a PhD. And yeah. then, you know, they're working with their hands and they're running around and, doing the cultures and doing this and this and this um yeah so you know but but yeah but in general age is good i mean yeah. in this industry i i i'd like to follow on from what toby just said i'm actually working with a very small company in the bay area where they had no quality department so i was a consultant hired in they needed to do qc guess who rolled their sleeves up and was doing the microbiology on the bench for them. It was me back uh, from, well, I don't want to tell you how long ago I was in the on the bench doing that work, but you know, getting in there, um, fortunately it was only for a short period of time they recruited somebody to do it, but it, it's that sort of, uh, of, of things when you're particularly older is, is be prepared Whatever's needed, you know, help out. Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would agree. I mean, usually people in this industry they start at the bench and then they move up and they become supervisors and then you know they're and yeah. they're training and they're you know uh, supervising, but they're no longer at the bench and then eventually they become VP. You're really you know, far away from the bench, but um, there's a. It used to be in the tech industry that fifty was the new forty. Forty was the new fifty. Is that do I get it right? <laughs> 50 is a new 40. Um, in the biotech industry, 50 is still the same 50. I mean, <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> there's a, that's not happening in the biotech industry. <laughs> yeah. Also, I, I, I think being somewhat older uh, on this as a consultant, um, I have an incredible working relationship with the CEO and CTO. And if I think they're full of it, I tell them, and they're actually quite happy to, to hear that from me, uh, especially if I explain why. So yeah, it, it's it's quite quite uh, opportunity out there. Let's say that. Let's see other ones. And one thing that I want to share, if uh, you know you are looking for you know a job or something, and you don't know where to start. 
I think one place that you may have had the perception that is a good place where to start because you can gain knowledge, but also the, uh, the insights of the wonderful people that are involved is uh, the uh, Berkeley Extension. So uh, all the instructors that have been in the industry for a while, they have an extense of extensive uh, networking. So if you really don't know where to start, maybe taking a class, a certificate program at Berkeley Extension can be a good place where you can start if you don't know from where. There Thank was one, one simple question and maybe Toby could answer this one. Should I put a picture on my resume? Somebody asked that question. So that's a European thing. They put it on the resume and actually that's going away. So you don't want to bias the hiring manager. Um, we don't want to see your picture. And, but you can include it on LinkedIn and you really want your LinkedIn picture to be professional. Um, <laughs> you don't want to be drinking a beer or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but, but no longer, no, we don't want to see uh, pictures on the resume. I mean, it's, it's not going to, it's not a deal breaker, but it's, it's not really commonly accepted in the United States. So um, we are about at time. Um, thank you so much to everyone, um, to our panelists and also to our audience for being here. Uh, thank you for your fantastic questions. I do hope we got to, um, to most of them. And we would like to invite you all uh, to a special upcoming virtual hiring event uh, co-sponsored by our friends at the San Francisco Job Forum. And so we have the information up for you here. Uh, please keep an eye on your email. Uh, registration information uh, will be announced in the coming weeks. And we can, yep. Uh, so should you have any questions, uh, we have our uh, email up here. Um, please uh, email us at biotechonline at berkeley.edu um, with any any questions and we would be very happy to get back with you. Um, and thank you again uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, again, thank you to our panelists and to our audience. And we hope that you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And best of luck with your career. Yes. Indeed.